Hello guys, this is Schizo Saint. I have been doing this YouTube thing off and on for about three years, just documenting my trainings, my adventures, and making whatever videos I want, and it has been a blast. In the process, I have created a very small, but extremely dedicated and very fun community, and I feel I owe it to you guys to do a little bit of a QA. and a I did originally film a proper Q&A out in the woods, but when I checked my GoPro, um, for whatever reason, the video was on 10x speed, so <laughs> I don't know why the GoPro did that, so the footage in the background you're going to see is from my first ever solo backpacking trip. I, it's some of the most pretty shots I, I have ever filmed, so feel free to enjoy that. Of course, this video is going to be a little bit of a longer one, so if you just want to listen to it kind of like you would a podcast, <laughs> that's fine as well. Um, I have gathered some questions both from my Discord community and from my YouTube community, um, so I'll just go down the list. The first question is, what is your dad like? Um, I really like this question. It wasn't until I was older, and when I say older, I mean like 20, 21. It wasn't until I was older that I realized that most people, you know, if they had a dad at all, Maybe he wasn't the best example. Uh, maybe he was either horrible with money or horrible to their mom or, or whatever. Really tragic stuff. I didn't realize how prolific that was in this country until I was older. And it's made me more and more grateful for my dad. My dad by no means is perfect. He's not perfect by, by any means is what I mean. But, I mean, he was always putting his family before himself. I mean, this is a man that was constantly sacrificing so that his family can have a better future. Let me give you a, a, a quick story that I think perfectly encapsulates the kind of man my dad is. I was, I think, 10 or 11 years old. And of course, we were living in a house in Utah. And I slept in the basement while the kitchen was right above me. And it was super late at night, I think 1130, maybe even 12 o'clock at night. And I hear my dad and my mom yelling at each other, just screaming. It was the most intense fight that I'd ever heard them have. I mean, at least that I can remember. I'm sure there were other ones. But I mean, it was just so aggressive. I was like, oh, my gosh. I mean, they never do this. Are they going to get in a divorce? Like, what's happening? So I get really scared. And so I go up the stairs and I'm really quiet and I'm really stealthy and I'm lying on the top of the stairs that lead into the family room, which was connected to the kitchen. So I was out of their sight. So I, I still don't know if they knew that I overheard this, <laughs> but I hear my mom yelling at my dad. She goes, you know, it was my turn to do the dishes. How can you do this to me? How could you possibly dare to, <laughs> to do the dishes? And my dad goes, listen, You've had a long day with the kids. I was at work super late, so I owe it to you to do this. So go to bed. <laughs> the fight went something along those lines. And I remember just laughing, just crying, laughing, chuckling to myself that this is what they were yelling at each other over. And he set the best example to me right there. He's like, if you're going to fight with your spouse, it needs to be because you did too much. If you're going to argue with your wife, it's because you went above and beyond what you're expected to do. And it's so funny because in my marriage now, my wife yells at me for the exact same thing. And um, when I face God one day after I die, I want that to be what I have to repent for. Not because I hit her or because I was financially irresponsible or whatever. I want my problem to be that I served my wife too much. So he just set the perfect example for me in that way. So I could talk forever, not just about my dad, but about my mom as well, but I could not have asked for better parents. And I would just say, you know, if you're nervous about being a dad because maybe you didn't have a dad or your dad wasn't present or whatever, I would just say, listen, there, there's plenty of great men out there that can serve as your example. And lucky for you, there's a wonderful book. It's been around for a few thousand years that has great examples of what it means to be a good father as well. And so just because maybe you didn't have that blessing, that doesn't mean you can't break the cycle and be the father that you wish you had to a kid. So I would just say that. Um, what a great man. On to the next question. I see you do Utah West Desert Expeditions semi-regularly. The question is, have you seen the Dugway Lights? I once saw something fly out of the Proving Grounds and break apart over Red Cedar Mountain. So it's definitely a real phenomenon. So for those of you that don't know about this, so Utah is famous for Skinwalker Ranch and for the national parks that lie in the southern part of the state. When you think of the Utah Desert, you're probably thinking of one of those two places. But Utah's West Desert is technically, I think, the biggest in the state, if not the second biggest. 
Uh, it's an enormous portion of the state. It, most of it is federal land. And there's a very specific part of that desert called the Dugway Proving Grounds. Now, a lot of my armed expeditions have been in the northern part of the West Desert. Du I believe Dugway is a little more, I, I guess, west the, of where I am. And yes, I have definitely seen weird phenomenon in the skies. I've seen planes. Um, I, I don't know what to call it, dogfighting? I've seen definitely a lot of aircraft out there doing weird things. Um, one time I was out shooting and there was a C-130 that flew just a few hundred yards above my head. I think they were just having a little bit of fun. Uh, but yeah, a lot of military activity out there. Um, as far as like paranormal things, the first ever YouTube video I ever did uh, was about a trumpet sound that I heard while I was out in the West Desert. By pure chance, my first ever YouTube video, I caught a really odd trumpet sound coming out of the mountains. Now, I believe the next video, we kind of debunked it because we heard a similar sound when an airplane, when an airliner, to be specific, flew uh parallel to the mountains and so we believe that something with the jet engines and the geometry of the mountains created that trumpet sound i don't know though i'm not sure if that was fully debunked it, it certainly there's weird things going on out there in the west desert um you have to think if there's one area 51 where they play around with anomalous objects there's probably dozens of other <laughs> bases where they play around with this stuff that isn't documented um would it surprise me if dugway was one of them not at all what does the United States look like four months from now? Um, I am recording this audio on October 12th. So listen, here's the reality, man. Only God knows <laughs> what, the, what the world looks like in four months. Satan probably doesn't even know. The elites don't know. Jesus might not even know. <laughs> right? Only God the Father knows what the world's going to be like in four months. It is so unpredictable. There are so many moving parts and incredibly powerful forces all coming to a head here. Um, I have absolutely no idea. I wouldn't be surprised if we were involved in some kind of crazy internal conflict. Um, I, I will say this. I don't think Trump's president in four months. Now, if things ran the way they say they run, absolutely he'd be president, obviously. Um, and I'm not even necessarily the most pro-Trump guy in the world. But I mean, if you just look at the general sentiment of the public, I mean, there's just no way he wouldn't be president. But I mean, I don't know, man, if you keep up with S2 Underground, if you keep up to speed on the kinds of things that we're faced here in the United States, faced with here. Um, yeah, man, I don't think there's any shot we have a President Trump in four months, even if he is elected, even if that's allowed to happen. Um, I, I mean, there's so many ways they can stop him from, <laughs> well, being alive between now and January. Uh, and even if he does make it to January, I mean, who's to say something won't happen from the time he becomes president to, you know, the next four years. So, Sorry, I know it's a little jumbled, but basically all I'm trying to say is I have absolutely no idea what's happening within the next four months. The only way to adequately prepare is get your food storage up, get your iodine tablets, get your water purification systems up and running, which that's actually pretty cheap. Um, you can do all that on the cheap. Get your combat rifle up to speed, get it zeroed. And this is kind of a weird thing to say, but I would say maybe don't shoot uh, your 556 five, stash for the next four months. I, I know it's kind of a weird thing to say. Um, train with 22 long rifle and of course get your rifle zeroed on the cartridges that you're going to be shooting. But, you know, maybe instead of shooting your ammo, <laughs> maybe now's the time to save it. Uh, maybe buy some ammo, put it in the can and lock it up for a minute um, and then spend a lot of money on, on food storage. That's really all you can do. Um, I know it's kind of weird advice to give. You don't hear that a lot, but ammo is expensive. It's hard to replace once you get rid of it. And so now's the time. Maybe just put a halt on shooting for a minute, um, get physically fit, and of course get materially fit. And most importantly of all, get spiritually fit. Maybe now's the time. If you're uh, religious curious, maybe it's time to investigate that part of yourself a little bit more. So that's all I would say moving forward in the next four months. This next question comes from my Discord community. Where is Bigfoot most likely to be encountered? Uh, this is a really funny question. So let's put Bigfoot in context here. If Bigfoot's real, we already know a lot of things about it. For one, it probably evolved during the Ice Age, and it specifically evolved to avoid people. If it didn't specifically evolve to avoid people, we'd already have it in a zoo. We'd have a taxidermied one <laughs> in the Smithsonian, right? Or maybe they'd hide it. But anyway, do uh, you, you see my point? This is a creature that 
explicitly avoids human beings at all costs. Animals generally avoid people anyway, but we're talking about a creature that probably has the exact same IQ as us. But instead of using that IQ to that, excuse me, that IQ to develop tools and social structures like human beings do, it uses that IQ to evade detection and to understand its environment perfectly. During the Ice Age, the Bigfoot creature saw that human beings, as long as they work in groups, can basically kill anything. Mammoths, bears, saber-toothed cats. There was nothing that could stop us if we put our minds to it. It probably learned really quickly to avoid us. And so the only way you're going to encounter a Sasquatch really is by chance. If you catch one off guard, if you're somewhere where humans don't typically go, uh, that's really the only way you're going to find one. It's going to be by sheer luck. I, I mean, the reality is, is that's why all these, you know, finding Bigfoot TV shows or whatever, that's why they're all a gigantic waste of time and money. I mean, you're just not going to intentionally run into one. Now, there are things like the Skookum, Skookum cask um, and footprints, and, and there are evidences out there for Bigfoot that if you really, like, devote your life and money and energy, you probably could find evidences of Bigfoot. But as far as getting a Bigfoot on camera, again, it's just going to be by sheer chance. Um, so of course their main habitat is probably going to be, you know, like where this video takes place in the deep mountains, in the deep woods. I mean, that's the kind of habitat these things have, but these things can smell you, hear you and see you way before you smell, hear or see them, which is going to make them getting out of the way very easy. So your chances of finding Bigfoot on purpose are slim to none. The next question also from a discord user what is more important to not cheap out on? A rifle, a rig, or a ruck? Now, I understand when he says rig, we're referring to chest rigs, uh, plate carriers, and LBE. Recently, I have joined LBE Gang. I bought British web gear, and I bought it for 40 bucks off Commando Store. And it works really well. This is literally military-grade equipment. It hasn't broke. It's got some quirks because it's an older design, but... It works really well, and I've been able to cram a ton of gear onto it, and I was able to get it for 40 bucks. And keep in mind, again, this is military gear. This isn't airsoft gear. This isn't some Alibaba clone. This is legitimate, functional military gear. So there are good deals out there if you know what to look for and if you do your research. Uh, I would also say that if you can afford to spend more money there, great, do it. But here's the thing. There's a lot of people learning right now in the Carolinas and in Georgia and in Florida that instead of spending $3,000 on their AR-15, they should have maybe spent $700 on their AR-15 and then spent the rest of that money on medicine, communication, food, and water. I think there's a lot of people learning that lesson the hard way right now. And we should learn that lesson for those of us who aren't in the disaster zone. We should learn that now. And so... Personally, you know, I've probably got more guns than I need. I know it's kind of a heretical thing to, to say out loud or admit, <laughs> but I probably do, right? And so maybe it's worth offloading a weapon for three or 400 bucks and then spending all of that money on medical supplies, on a great Baofeng setup, on water purification, and a ton of food. Think about how much of that stuff you could get for just 400 bucks. 400 bucks barely gets you a functional gun these days. And so these are the kinds of things that we should be thinking about. Of course, you shouldn't, you should always have a few guns, but you should make sure that you have your priorities straight. And so when it comes to, say, a rifle, if you buy a Palmetto State Armory AR-15 for 500 bucks, and then you put in a $200 Sons of Liberty bolt carrier group, well, you now have a $700 AR-15 that you got for relatively cheap that is probably going to last a really long time. And then you spend, say, 100 bucks on a Sig Romeo 5 Red Dot site, 100 bucks on a Streamlight light setup, and then 20 bucks on a sling. And you have a really useful, really capable weapon system that you spent under a grand on. And so you just need to know what to look for. And that's part of what some of my YouTube videos are geared around. I want to make sure people are getting good deals um, when it comes to outfitting their rifle. As far as a ruck, I think this really comes down to what your priorities are. So, for example, on this backpacking trip, I used a Mystery Ranch Terra Frame 50. It's definitely a higher-end pack, but all a high-end pack or ruck is going to do is just distribute the pain evenly. It's still going to hurt, right? There's no way to backpack 40 pounds of gear into the woods without it hurting your body, okay? So, this whole trip, I was just sore 
all over instead of specifically on my waist and my shoulders. <laughs> so it just really depends on how much you prioritize pain management. Um, and I think we already discussed the rifle. So as far as your rig, there are really cheap ways to get ammunition, medical supplies, and communications equipment on your person. I have reviewed a $60 chest rig. I'm not going to say it's the best thing in the world. It's not, but it did hold together. It will function. It will work. It will carry the necessary gear you need. My next question is one of my favorite. What happened during Operation High Jump? So to catch those up who don't know about this, it was an operation that took place in the year 1946 and ended in 1947. The official story is that it was just a simple operation to go and analyze what it would be like to fight in Arctic conditions, what would what kind of equipment would be required, what kind of strategies and tactics would need to be employed if war broke out in some kind of Arctic or Antarctic region. Now, there's a few problems with the story. <laughs> One is that later on, Admiral Byrd's journal was published. In this journal, Admiral Byrd tells a fantastic tale of when he was flying in an airplane, he was intercepted by UFOs with swastikas on him, and then he was taken down a hole into hollow earth. He went to a grand, beautiful city and was sat down by someone called the Grand Master who warned him of the dangers and perils of nuclear weapons. It's a great story, and it's still believed by many. But the problem is, is that this journal was almost certainly forged by Admiral Byrd's son. It has lines that were directly ripped off from movies, sci-fi movies at the time, and sci-fi novels. The story is almost certainly completely fake. A lot of people will learn that and then leave the rest of the story alone. But that's not the end of what happened during Operation High Jump. Soviet intelligence came out many decades later reporting that while they were spying on the Americans during Operation High Jump, they noted that some planes were shot down by UFOs. Listen, Antarctica is a very frightening place and it's very tightly controlled. Anyone who tells you otherwise is lying. The entire continent is split up between different nations. So here's the thing. If UFOs are going to hide anywhere, Antarctica is a good place to go. So I wouldn't be surprised if that Soviet intelligence report was true. Now, is there any other way to confirm it? I don't think so. But as we know from the Fitbit leaks and a bunch of other interesting documents that have come out, Antarctica is a place of suspicion and interest for basically every relevant country. If there's spooky stuff going on anywhere, it is down there. So what exactly happened during Operation High Jump? Did Admiral Byrd really go down the Agartha Hole, see woolly mammoths, and go into Hollow Earth? Probably not. But are there weird things happening down there? Absolutely. It should be noted that it is standard military intelligence procedure to make real fantastic stories even more fantastic and crazy. This way, the story is completely polluted. So if someone tries to tell the part of the story that the government doesn't want you to know, people will write it off. This is what happens a lot with Area 51 leaks. People will talk about the almost certainly real anti-gravity engines and crash UAPs that they find. But then U.S. intelligence will add in a part of the story that's crazy, like they're tall white people from the Pegasus galaxy or whatever. They'll forge a part of the story to make it crazy. So that way people will write it off, even though the important part of that whole thing is that, hey, there's anti-gravity engines in Area 51. So this is just the kind of thing you need to look out for while you're investigating these stories. There's almost always a part of the story that is extravagant and true but it is going to be intentionally manipulated and polluted so less people take it seriously. Okay, and the last question I'll be addressing, what is better, the AK platform or the AR-15 platform? The reality is, is I don't think in the bigger picture the differences matter that much. Yes, they are very different in terms of design, but in terms of implementation, they're very similar. They're both intermediate cartridge rifles that have 30-round magazines with magazines that can be easily replaced, both are extremely reliable and used by the world's most important militaries and special operations groups. They are, again, extremely different in terms of design and form, but by function, they're basically the same. If you switched out everyone's AR with an AK and AK with an AR, it really wouldn't change the outcome of any conflict. I would say you should just get what your buddies run. So if you're just getting into this and you have two other dudes that are into this as well and they're both running ARs, you should probably get an AR. If they both have AKs, you should get AKs. I don't think the differences matter that much. 
I will say, I think the AK is a lot of fun. And I think in my environment where I have moose and grizzlies to worry about, I think it makes sense to have 762 by 39. But again, I don't really know if it matters that much. I will say the, the AR-15 is not only going to be cheaper, but it is a little bit more reliable on the lower end. So if you're just getting started, I would recommend getting an AR. But in the grand scheme, I don't think it matters. All right, guys, and that was it. Thank you so much for watching. It was so fun answering these questions. I'm planning on starting a podcast at some point just because I know a lot of interesting people that I'd love to interview and I'd love to get their opinions out there. So if you want to see that, go ahead, like, comment, and subscribe. Get as much engagement on this video as possible so it spreads far and wide. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.